everybody. Welcome to my Shalom Zone. My name is Sherry Dawn and it is my great honor and privilege to be able to bring this grace encounter and share it with you today. I want to share something with you that I believe is going to bring some peace to your heart if you're having problems with your heart being troubled at the moment because of all the craziness that's happening in the world and I believe it will give you a little different perspective and add a little dimension to what you understand about the prophecies in regarding the end times and give you some hope where maybe you did not have some before. So let's get into the scriptures. Jesus in foretelling of these days spoke in the book of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 14 saying that this gospel of the kingdom had to be preached in all the nations as a witness before the end came. And so many times we read that and we think, oh, the end, you know, I'm not going to be able to raise my family. It's going to be the end of the world as I know it. No, no, no. And, and that's true. It's going to be the end of the world as we know it. But we have to understand there's a positive spin on that. And it's not us trying to stretch our imaginations to try to seek a positive spin. What he is declaring is that it's going to be the end of Satan's reign on this planet, the end of Babylon's confusion and witchcraft and seduction and all of the rot and the corruption that has been let into this planet and allowed to work destruction because of Adam and Eve's sin. So it's the end of that, and it's bringing in what God has promised and what God ordained and what he had in mind from the beginning. So even though there are some things that will maybe hurt our flesh to think of not getting to fulfill or participate in, what is developing and what is happening is so much greater, so much richer, so much more glorious that those other things are just going to pale in comparison. Now, notice that it takes the good news of Jesus Christ to bring an end to the corruption that was born out of sin and death entering this planet. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 tells us that it's the gospel of Christ that is the power of God unto salvation. When you minister the truth of the gospel, whoever believes it, regardless of their social status, regardless of the color of their skin, regardless of the amount of their bank account or lack thereof, when they believe that, salvation is the result. And it's that ongoing salvation because every time you listen to what that gospel has to say to you as the redeemed of the Lord, whatever situation you need saving from today, that same gospel has the power to produce whatever help, salvation you need for the day, whether it's healing, rescue, deliverance, protection, preservation. All of those terms are wrapped up in that word that is translated salvation there from the Greek. Romans 1 and verse 17 says that it's in that gospel that the righteousness of God is revealed. Now, why does that even matter? Because the righteousness of God cannot be earned. It's given as a gift, and it must be received as a gift. Romans chapter 5 and verse 17 says that they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life by Jesus Christ. So it's a gift. I mean, that's what scripture testifies and says. And we either believe that or we don't. If we don't, we keep running into roadblocks. If we do, the way keeps opening up and being made more clear to us. So the gospel must be preached before the end of Satan's reign can come. And that gospel reveals not the nastiness of man, but the righteousness of God given to us as a gift. Now, revelation of that righteousness brings light. 
and where light is darkness cannot function in order for darkness to function light has to be removed but I don't care how big a room you've got or how dark it may be when you flip the switch and the light is turned on the darkness is gone well, this is what the Lord's after. He's flipping some switches, okay? So I want you to look forward to that. There's a prophecy in the book of Psalm 37, verse 6. Now, remember the scripture says David was a prophet. Many, many times he would start writing, and he would just start out with where he was and how he was feeling at the moment, or maybe he would just start praising the Lord. But then you'll notice that all at once, the, the tenor, the voice has changed, and it's the Holy Spirit speaking through him so this is one of those places and he's speaking and he said and he speaking of the lord shall bring forth thy righteousness as the light and thy judgment as the noon day now i find this fascinating because the entire context of that psalm 37 is him trying to encourage people to not be fretting over what evildoers are doing don't get all tore up and angry and upset because of the way they're behaving and because of what it's causing to happen in the earth. He is pointing out whatever they're doing, whatever hullabaloo they're involved in, it's all going to come to nothing. And so he says, don't fret over that. And he also stresses two or three different times in that same psalm that it's the people that wait on the Lord. It's the meek that are going to inherit the earth that everybody else is fighting over. Do you see? So no sense of getting all tied up in knots over that. Their efforts are going to be uh, brought, brought to nothing, according to the scriptures. He also says that our judgment would be brought out as the noonday. Now, this is not the great white throne judgment. This has something to do with bringing forth what has been placed within. In fact, that word bring forth it's from the Hebrew word yatzah, and it means to bring out, to bring forth, or to be risen. So think about that. Something from within, rising, something being brought out, but it's righteousness as light. Something as noonday, our, our judgment as noonday. So we're looking at coming out of darkness into a great brightness, a great light. Get that picture in your thinking. Now, righteousness is we see from this scripture is going to be manifesting as light. Now, the scripture tells us in other places that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. So I can't just take one verse and build a message around that. There has to be supporting verses that say the same thing or that point out the same truth. Malachi chapter 4 and verse 2 tells us that unto us that fear the name of the Lord, the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. So again, we see the picture of a great brightness and righteousness and it rising and there being a healing and a restoration as a result of that. Sun is from the Hebrew word shemesh and it means brilliant, array, the sun. Arise is from zarach and it means to irradiate, to shoot forth beams. So here are these pictures that something happens, something shifts, and all of a sudden where there was not light before, now there is, and it is getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Now, where does the brilliant light of righteousness arise? He said he's going to arise with healing in his wings. Does the scripture have an answer for that? Sure. Isaiah chapter 60 and verse 2 tells us that the Lord shall arise upon us and his glory shall be seen upon us. Woohoo! Okay. So, track with me now. Number one, the gospel must be preached for the end to come. Number two, the gospel reveals the righteousness of God. Number three, that righteousness is placed in us as a gift, but it's brought forth as light. And number four, the light rises on us. And according to the book of Isaiah, when the nations see it, they are drawn 
to the brightness of that rising. Now, with all that, you're thinking, let's look at a third witness. Isaiah chapter 62. Verses 1 and 2, the scripture says, For Zion's sake I will not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth and the Gentiles or the nations shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Well, the book of Jeremiah tells us that we're going to be called the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah said can you? Okay. The bride takes the name of the groom and that's his name, Jehovah Seed Canoe, the Lord our righteousness. There is a generation who grows up realizing anything good, anything righteous about me, it's Jesus. It's not me. And we're happy to own that it's Jesus. It's not me. So listen carefully. Revelation of righteousness and the salvation, rescue, deliverance, help, safety, all of the, it, is, it means the same thing in Hebrew as it does in Greek. All of that goes hand in hand. The righteousness and the salvation, the restoration, the healing. So listen carefully because Satan would love for you to miss what I'm about to say. Psalm 37 verse 6 said he will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your judgment as the noonday. Now this is not speaking about righteousness by keeping the works of the law because that's what the Pharisees did. And Jesus was very blunt when he told the Pharisees, except your righteousness exceed that of the Pharisees and the scribes. He said, you're going to in no wise have any part of me. That's my paraphrase. So he's speaking to the disciples, and he's letting them know, your righteousness, if you're going to get anywhere in the kingdom, it's got to exceed that of what the Pharisees and the scribes do. Well, they thought they had a handle on keeping that law. So this righteousness that's going to be brought forth as light, it's got to be the righteousness that's received as a gift because God is light. There's no darkness in him, and our righteousness is of God. Okay, that's what the scripture testifies. So, then which judgment could this possibly be speaking about that's going to be brought forth as the noonday because the righteousness is being brought forth as the light? Judgment is from the Hebrew word mishpat and it means the verdict, the justice, or a sentence. Do you understand that there was a judgment made at the cross? Let me read you John chapter 12 and verses 23 through 31. This is such a powerful thing. Very illuminating. This is Jesus is speaking in verse 23. Jesus answered them saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. So he's prophesying, foretelling his death and his resurrection. And the fact that because he did what he did, there was going to be fruit produced after his kind. That is the law of Genesis. Tomatoes produced tomatoes. Watermelons produced watermelons. The Spirit of Christ produced Christians. All right? He that loveth his life shall lose it. He that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people therefore that stood by heard it and they said that it thundered, but others said an angel spoke to him. Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now, when, when is now? Now, <laughs> A-N-O-W, now. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world 
be cast out. So Jesus is speaking specifically in context in the reference to his death and his resurrection that there's a judgment that takes place against the prince of this world. Woohoo! That's good news. I don't care what day of the week it is. Okay? Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Alright, let's go on over to John chapter 16. And start reading at verses 7 through 11. Now Jesus understood that now was the time that the prince of this world would be judged and cast out. So when he said, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do from the cross, God forgave us. God made a decision. God made a judgment. Do you understand? He ruled against the devil, and he ruled in favor of humanity. We have to nail that down, and we have to approach life from that position. God has ruled in our favor. He gave us grace in Christ Jesus. All that's left is for us to choose to receive it. Okay? Now, John 16, this is after they've had the uh, Lord's Supper. The Lord has had the last Passover that he will share with them under the Old Covenant. He's instituted the Lord's Supper as the symbols of the New Covenant, receiving that covenant meal so that you can benefit from what ever was given us at the cross. He's ordained that, set that in motion. He's washed the disciples' feet. And now he's telling them some kingdom truths just before he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and enters his time of suffering. So these, all of his words are important, but these are especially important because he's reached the end of his time here on this earth and he's imparting vital information. So we want to pay special attention to this. He's speaking in reference to sending back the Holy Spirit to take up his place, his work as the comforter and to help us. John 16, verse 7, Jesus speaking. He said, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart... I will send him unto you. And when he's come, now this is the job description of the Holy Spirit. This is something else we got to get nailed down. When he's come, he will reprove the world of sin. Now that word reprove is from a Greek word that means to, um, to reprove and to convict or convince. Okay? He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Well, if you just read that verse and quit, you think all three of those things are lumped together. But Jesus goes on to explain. He says, of sin, because they, they who, who would be reproved of sin, the world, they believe not on me. So the one sin that the Holy Spirit is sent to convict the world of is not believing on Jesus. Because why? Because once you receive him as your Savior and you get in him, Every other sin has been forgiven. God laid on him the iniquity of us all. We're forgiven. We're just receiving that forgiveness. So he convicts the world of the sin of not believing on Jesus. Verse 10, of righteousness, because I go to my Father, and ye, or you, see me no more. Now, who's he talking to, believers or unbelievers? He's just washed the disciples' feet. They've just had the Lord's Supper. He's talking to believers. So get this in your thinking. Get this straight. The Holy Spirit is sent to convince the world of not believing on Jesus, but he's sent to believers to convince them they've been made righteous. Whoo! Glory to God. Of righteousness. Because I go to my Father, and you see me no more. And then he puts the icing on the cake. Verse 11. Of judgment, because the prince of this world is judged. Oh, hallelujah. Now, we have to remember that God's time is not exactly like our time, because God lives outside time. He created time. He's not bound by time. 
but the book in the writings of Peter tells us that a thousand years is as God's way of time and keeping up with stuff. It's only been three days since Satan was judged. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, generally in courts of law, there's a time when the judge passes the sentence and the time that the sentence is actually carried out. Well, we're in the generation and the time now that the sentence is carried out. He's judged. Every step he is taking is moving him inexorably. That means can't be stopped. <laughs> moving him toward the pit. Because God judged against him and he ruled in favor of humans. Now, it's time for the sentence to become as bright as the noonday sun. That's the judgment that's being brought forth as the righteousness is being brought forth as the light. There are so many prophecies that are falling into place because this is the outpouring that's prophesied for the third day generation in Hosea chapter 6. Prophecies like the one in Isaiah 61 and verse 11 that says the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to spring forth before all nations. Amos chapter 9 and verse 11 tells us that the plowman is going to overtake the reaper and God is raising up the tabernacle of David. Do you understand the shift that has taken place in Christian music and, and going from singing, Dear old mama, we're going to die and be in heaven after a while, one of these days has gone from that kind of stuff into very heartfelt, intimate worship in the last 20 to 30 years? That's not an accident. God is raising up the tabernacle of David because that's what that tabernacle was all about. The sides were raised up so people could have access to see the Ark of the Covenant where the presence of God dwelt under that old covenant. And it was 24-7 praise and worship, thanksgiving, going up before the presence of God. God is raising up a generation who's living that lifestyle all over this planet. Any given moment, any day or night, any day of the week, there's praise and worship going up from the family of God. Habakkuk 2.14 God is causing the knowledge of the glory of the Lord to cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. And as I'm so fond of saying, there is no place in the sea that's not wet. <laughs> Things are happening. Jesus told us, in his prophecies of the last days, that things were going to get rough. But he also told us to look up because our redemption was drawing nigh. Now, why would he say that? Everybody else is looking around at what's happening in the natural. And Jesus said that when they did that, their hearts would fail them for fear. You can get so tore up over things, you can give your own self a heart attack. And Jesus said, don't be looking at that stuff. He does, he's not telling us to be ignorant of it. We have to be aware because we live here. But we do not have to let our minds dwell on it and meditate it to the degree that it affects our health and kills us. He said, look up. Look at him. He also said, let not your heart be troubled. Now, how, pray tell, when all this stuff is going on, am I supposed to keep my heart from being troubled? Well, we have to start by meditating on the things that Jesus has said, by filling our hearts and our minds with what he has promised and with what he's got planned for this time as he raises up his kingdom in this earth. We have to declare his victory. You listen to you more than you listen to anybody else. That's the reason all this negative stuff that you say about yourself that nobody else hears but it's all in your head, but your spirit's hearing it. And your spirit is responding to it. And I got news for you, sugar. So is your body. And you keep cursing yourself with words of negativity. Your health is going to go right down the tubes. I'm sorry if that didn't agree with your political correctness. But that's the way it is. But the minute you start changing the words of your mouth and you start speaking out over yourself and your family what God has declared over yourself and your family, you're going to see some positive changes made. That's the way it works. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. And what you think about is going to become an abundance in your heart. And it's out of your heart that you bring forth either good things or evil things by what you say. Quit 
thinking on the negative junk. Either God's got this or we're all in trouble. But he's got this. And this is the time that he's bringing forth your righteousness and my righteousness as a light. And he's bringing forth our judgment as the noonday. This is the time when Satan gets a big embarrassment because everything that he is trying so hard to orchestrate and to do is ultimately destined to blow up in his face. And when you understand that, it's kind of hard for him to holler boo and make you jump because you know the guy that's got his number. Do you see? Oh, please, please let the Holy Spirit minister to your heart and give you some hope. You do not have to live in a state of fear, regardless of what man has planned. God has already orchestrated something that's so big, so marvelous, and it's been like baking powder working in the flour. <laughs> All that's needed. You can't tell much is going on until you add the buttermilk. But when you add the buttermilk, that stuff's going to rise. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, the kingdom's rising. That's what I'm here to tell you. So get your eyes on what God's doing. Don't let this other stuff move you into a place where you're completely incapacitated by fear. No, God did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And he's speaking Right now, he's drawing people. He's letting them understand there's a shift taking place. There's something going on. Hang on. Look up. Things are changing. Listen to that little voice that's telling you that. Whether we like it or not, whether the world likes it or not, I like it fine. <laughs> the scripture has declared in the book of Revelation that the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord. We keep our hearts and our thoughts and our minds on what God's doing, then there's going to be rest and there's going to be peace in our hearts. And when you're at peace and at rest in your heart, it's easier to hear when the Lord is directing you. Go this way, make this decision, do this, do that. And you'll find out that even though everything else is in chaos and turmoil, God is walking you through it. He's preparing a table for you in the very presence of your enemies. And he's seeing to it that you lie down in green pastures and that you walk beside still waters, and that your cup runs over in spite of it all. Mm. Let me bless you, and I'm going to hush. The Lord bless you and raise up the lion that's within you. It is written of these days that God roars out of Zion. Therefore, I bless your ability to hear his voice. And in Jesus' name, I bless your ability to speak forth what he gives you to say over your life and over the lives of your family. The Spirit of the Lord rise upon you and cause you to move in greater anointing, greater faith, greater boldness, greater wisdom, so that Jesus alone is glorified in this time. Shalom to you, beloved of the Lord. Amen. <laughs> I'll talk to you later, and I will not apologize for getting excited. <laughs>